So what we do at CARE is work through the ways in which communication can address the injustices that we see globally. The theoretical framework we draw upon is uh, the culture-centered approach, which makes a fairly simple argument, which is that when you build voice infrastructures, meaning uh, resources, spaces, um, architectures for voices of those at the margins, uh, those become the basis for transforming structures. When you build these voice infrastructures, that those who have systematically been marginalized can participate in these voice infrastructures to mobilize, to articulate uh, their voices, and uh, through that process, uh, change the overarching norms, rules, um, and frameworks that guide how resources are uh, distributed in society. I would say there are three things that comes to my mind when I think about CARE and its features. Um, the first one, just the evidence uh, and impact of collaborating with community members. And I think that's very central to, to the work that CARE does. Um, and I would say Professor Dutta, right, he lives by what he preaches. Um, in, in doing that, right, he's also had struggles and sort of target on his, on his back. Um, but I think his work is an inspiration um, for many people who are interested in working at the margins of academia and margins of society and kind of bridging that gap. And I think, um, so the one thing that I would say is definitely this um, collaboration with community members. Academia is often criticized for living in the ivory tower, um, but CARE has created this bridge between being in the ivory space and doing social work, right? Social change work um, on the ground. Um, and so, you know, one of the things I would say as a feature of that is also that it's an embodied process to walk that bridge, right? Um, you know, Professor Dutta is an academic, but he's also an ac activist. Um, and so he's proven numerous times through his work that to walk that connection, um, that we have to be part of that process and implicated in that process. And, and that means, right, we have to also put our bodies on the line and that it becomes embodied um, in that way. Here really is very much focused on, right, solidarity um, and building long-term relationship. And I think that's also a hallmark of, of doing care work, um, you know, is that it's not a performance of solidarity, right, or performance of relation building so that you have research or work and then you leave that space, but that it really is inherent in the work that CARE does and is very much, again, exemplified by what I just said earlier about how embodied this process is so that, you know, as you are working through this, you are also very much right, building solidarity and relationship. In a culture-centered project in the Pialgaria village in the Poshi Bindapur district of West Bengal, the CARE research team led by Professor Datta collaborated with community members in identifying local problems and developing locally meaningful solutions. Through participatory workshops, community-wide surveys designed by community members, and village-level meetings, community members decided to build local spaces for nurturing leisurely activities such as dances, games, and everyday interactions. In the life world of the community, these dances and games and the everyday interactions within the community were integral to their realization of health. Our culture-centered project, guided, designed, and owned by community members, zeroed in on building a local community center. The community planned the budget, the design, and the labor. Community members led the implementation of the project, contributing their labor, managing the accounts and resources, and coordinating the various activities. The Community Center project depicts the framework of the CCA 
in placing communities at the heart of concept development, ideation and implementation. When communities are placed at the center of design, they are the enablers in figuring out how to understand the problems in their everyday lives and the kinds of solutions they need to develop. In Singapore, when I first got there in 2013, um, he was trying to search out um, what I would call kind of hidden poverty because Singapore presents itself as such an outwardly affluent place that if you're just visiting there like I was, it would be hard to know that there were impoverished population. But he was trying to bring to the surface what was largely hidden. Let's uh, take, you know, the struggles of hyper precarious migrant workers in Singapore. And, you know, in the work that CARE has done over the last decade with migrant workers, you know, the thing that is often critical is how the everyday meanings of health are defined um, in terms of the processes of exploitation that make migrant workers uh, disposable and at the same time uh, the processes of representation um, that are not available to migrant workers. When he did projects like this, uh, they got the attention of people. There were rewards for the social impact that he had, but uh, it also got him into trouble. So you talked about his being a troublemaker. Because of the various uh, forms of repressive uh, strategies that might be deployed by, say, an authoritarian state such as Singapore, where migrant worker organizing uh, might um, actually be considered um, as um, outside of the legal normative framework. So to organize would uh, get you deported or might get you incarcerated. So within that context, again, the struggle for health is both struggle against exploitation and uh, struggle for voices of migrant workers to be heard. The social impact was both very good for the kinds of um, marginalized and stigmatized groups that he was working with and at the same time uh, made it kind of treacherous for him in doing that kind of work. have no energy left in our body. Due to this, we often fall ill and visit to the hospital. Many workers work at construction sites every day in Singapore. Having decent food is essential to a healthy body. Food that is unclean or unhygienic can adversely affect health of workers. Having sufficient quality and quantity of food is a basic health need of every worker. Respect the food rights of workers. So, CARE is a little bit different um, to other research centres um, in the sense that we, um, we use an approach called the cultured centred approach and rather than sort of going into a community and doing a one-off survey or a series of interviews and making an observation and then just leaving it there, we, we do field work and we actively work with community members to identify problems that are meaningful for them and co-develop um, respective solutions. Uh, so within um, my own field work um, in a place called Glen Innes, um, we co-developed a media campaign where residents could share their stories. Um, and so I've seen that, that social impact firsthand um, Following the research, we did a series of evaluative interviews and found that even the act of open-ended questions of what does health mean to you and what are the, some of the struggles that you're going through, that in itself um, had a degree of 
tr transformative element, just being listened to. But within the advisory meetings as well, you know, you see you see people taking ownership, you see people's attitudes changing, you see people becoming more and more involved. Um, and of course, with the campaign, uh, we were able to bring residents' voices to the forefront um, in ways that um, gained national attention. Where we live affects our health. Glen Innes' example is an excellent one for uh, communities negotiating poverty in Aotearoa. The everyday experiences of health are tied to the conditions of uh, poor housing or the lack of housing or what one might consider uh, housing insecurity um, and uh, you know that is directly connected to um, issues such as uh, mold um, in the housing, the lack of uh, proper insulation, um, the lack of access to heat during um, the winter months which uh, then again are intertwined with um, experiences of asthma, uh, experiences of uh, flu, um, uh, with symptoms like uh, bronchitis, uh, for instance, but also with overall sense of insecurity, which is key to health, including um, impacting mental health. Where you live determines the quality of your health care. I had to wait three hours three hours before I got up and asked them again. I had to come again to the library and sit there and read a book. After three hours, I came out, so I went back and so that about five hours before I was free. That happens every day. Waiting hours to receive medical care means that the sick get sicker. Poverty is not our future. Let's take the example of housing, is building the infrastructures for voice. Uh, the argument being that when you build these voice infrastructures and those at the margins can participate in articulating their voices and in expressing the meanings that are salient to them, that becomes the basis for generating empirically based, locally situated, um, conceptually rich knowledge claims, which then challenge those broader structures, but also through that process challenge the systems of erasure that have kept those kinds of knowledge frames out of the discursive space. So when CARE builds these or co-creates these voice infrastructures with communities at the margins, such as we saw in the um, No Singaporeans Left Behind campaign in Singapore, or uh, the campaign in Glen Innes, Poverty is Not Our Future, created by advisory group members um, made up of communities that are struggling with um, uh, poverty. Right? So these advisory groups in that sense are quite transformative. They are not built of uh, experts or professionals or service providers, but these advisory groups comprise uh, people, households that are negotiating poverty.
you know, if you consider the expanse of the work of care and, uh, you know, the work uh, over the decade it has uh, spanned um, over uh, 10 countries across uh, four continents. And uh, that work is sustained by local research leadership. And what that essentially means is that um, these researchers at the local level in various communities actually shape the theorizing process, take ownership of the theorizing process, and take ownership of the kinds of interventions that are created out of uh, that research process. Um, well, as a community researcher in Highbury, I thoroughly enjoyed it because I know my community really well and it was quite easy for me to tap into spaces around this community. Being a community researcher has, I guess, enabled me to reach I guess people in the community who might not usually be reached, uh, especially around what's going on for the hood and what we can do as a community to change it. Um, yeah, we see the good and the bad. I see the good and the bad in the community, and I, yeah, I'm I'm known, so it made people want to be more a part of the research going on around Highbury to see what we can do. But there's also that huge trust factor. So I am a community member, so that really did bring a lot more Fano and um, friends to come along and see what we were up to and how they can put their voice in and be heard to create this change. Um, a lot of the corridor that we had was quite raw and emotional, um, and that just makes it more special though, because those are exactly the things that we want to target and change um, around us here in Highbury. Maybe 10 of us, 12 of us, all being getting together for the last probably five weeks organising this beautiful and wonderful Matariki event, celebration for 2021, all sort of being totalling each other and just supporting each other, getting it all organised and, um, you know, gathering up all the resources and the tools and, yeah. This Matariki event is to come together as one and celebrate our Māori New Year and all different cultures, nationalities, we all come together as one and celebrate our Matariki. But everybody, like everyone, that's all the members of the advisory hybrid group have just been amazing. Um, everyone's just helped each other and um, get it, you know, get everything here and set up and um, ready for tonight, tonight's event. We actually come together as a, as a pano and discuss, you know, what things we can do for our community and how we can progress with a lot of our mahi. So uh, I've been with the group three years now. So, you know, in those three years I've seen how we've progressed. Just coming together as um, part of a, a community, part of the hybrid community, um, and just getting together and just sort of um, creating, creating this, this amazing event. We need our pano within the hybrid area to come as together as one, you know, where we support each other. Yeah. Where our community come together and we can be safe within our hybrid area. I think with our communities like ours, what Often the press looks for the negative story, and the, but there are lots of positive stories happening all the time. The community can get together to, to do positive stuff. We need to hear more about it. I think just be really proud of where we all live. I mean, I live here too, and we need, we need to be proud of our community and speak positively about it to people. The local leadership um, in knowledge generation is vital and community researchers therefore play um, important roles as lead authors or uh, collaborating authors. In fact, many of our white papers, policy briefs are led by or co-authored by community researchers, community organizers and activists. Um, what I personally for myself have, have felt and feel amongst our LGBTQI 
um, people is the togetherness, the whakwhanaungatanga, tautokotanga, afitanga, that feel good factor of bringing us all together and discussing that very important issue of um, sexual and family violence amongst our LGBTQI family. So yeah, yeah, it's been really, really enlightening for me and having to draw everybody in and talk about the experiences and, you know, sad, good experiences and everything. And yeah, it's been really, really good because I found out now that I'm talking to trans brothers. I never have ever, you know, I just say hi, 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 and walk by. Now, Oh, hello, brother. Oh, hello. Oh, you kings are so fabulous. And do you know what I mean? It's just, it's just that totoko tanga, me for knowing a tanga, that family support system, that, um, yeah, a supporting of going out there to reach out to all the different groups and everything. So, um, it's about the caring, sharing, supporting systems of how care have put into our LGBTQI group down in, down in Wellington. As you're uh, trying to experiment with these various forms of uh, knowledge generation and changing practices of um, uh, claiming ownership of knowledge, you're also struggling against a, a structure that is quite um, uh, set in terms of its traditional ways. So. Um, uh, you see what I mean that while you're um, uh, engaging in these practices, you're simultaneously trying to participate in conversations that hopefully transform how our discipline sees the work of knowledge generation and how um, the sort of the acknowledged structures of knowledge generation see the process of knowledge generation. And I think that is where we have more work to do as care. I had to survive. I had to make hard choices. Things have to change. There was no support. I had to sacrifice a lot. I'm tired. I'm over it. I'm done. Aroha. Aroha. I found my own. Be the pride. Be the colour. Be the rainbow. Be you. I want to talk a little bit about um, the um, uh, work with Deccan Development Society and uh, the Deccan Development Society is organized as Sanghams or collectives of um, largely landless Dalit or oppressed caste uh, women farmers and uh, the work of uh, the women farmers in building transformation in agriculture by turning to indigenous knowledge systems uh, by turning to practices such as seed saving and seed sharing, which challenge the neoliberal, um, uh, neocolonial onslaught on agriculture that we see across the global south, uh, is built upon creating voice infrastructures. And for the women, and this is you know something that women have done in DDS, 
uh, voice infrastructures take the forms of community radio and community based video storytelling. So they have already been doing that, you know, they run a radio station where they narrate the story of the seed, uh, but that is juxtaposed in the backdrop of them narrating um, everyday local events, uh, creating news uh, that is locally based, creating programming that is locally based, that draws upon um, uh, local cultural values, local cultural traditions to articulate the story of um, the seed. Uh, the same thing they do with video based uh, storytelling um, in terms of creating documentaries, um, building knowledge registers that actually challenge um, the uh, neoliberal uh, formation which uh, suggests that uh, biotechnology based agricultural interventions are the solutions to uh, food insecurity in the backdrop of climate change. And, and they create an intervention that actually uh, challenged this uh, very large scale um, uh, global knowledge system that is uh, fueled by the forces of uh, global capital. So you can think about um, the powerful forces behind uh, that uh, dominant knowledge system. And the women intervene into that through their uh, storytelling based upon video based uh, narratives. A key lesson in this project is how voices of communities matter. We have often said in culture centered work that when you listen to people, they tell you what the problems are and how to solve them. One thing we learned from the women farmers in this project, as you can see throughout their voices, is that when they participate and when they take ownership, they pretty much have a good understanding of how to go about solving problems. In this case, uh, the problem of climate change and how to adapt food systems to climate change. At the end of the day then, the key lesson to take away from this project is that listening to community voices, voices of the grassroots, can offer us solutions about how we look at uh, problems of global warming and climate change and look at ways of solving these problems. So the Activist in Residence program is created with the idea that activists who are negotiating structures, challenging structures, have much to offer uh, in terms of the uh, knowledge about struggles for justice by drawing upon their lived experiences in these struggles. So it goes back to this idea of democratizing knowledge um, through the culture-centered approach that we talked about earlier. And the Activist in Residence program is an intervention in uh, that sense fundamentally that it recognizes activists as generators of knowledge as participants in the process of knowledge generation. So an activist in residence spends about um, five to six days here with us um, at CARE. During that time, they uh, deliver a public talk, they participate in a workshop, and then they work with me on the white paper. And they also participate in a dialogue in the form of um, an interview. And it's, it's quite uh, powerful, Richard, in terms of seeing how that program works toward um, democratizing knowledge, but also building sustainable relationships toward that uh, process of changing uh, these hegemonic uh, structures, including structures of knowledge generation. It was quite an extraordinary experience when CARE first came to Aotearoa, New Zealand, about um, over four years ago now, I think. Um, because there'd never been anything like this before. Um, for decades, I've been working at the interface between academia and the activist world. And um, it's always been very concerning to me, the lack of understanding in, among university people about the realities of activist life and work for change and what, what the activist community can offer to the academic world and vice versa. So when this institute came to Palmerston North, and I first met Professor Dutta and his staff and, and research people. Um, I was so impressed at their genuine commitment to working with um, people, activists and researchers who are community-based in a genuinely respectful way rather than in the top-down elitist way that so often happens between um, academics and those of us who, at least in my case, mostly work outside the system, though I've been inside it as well. Um, so the, the genuine commitment to 
bridging the academic activist divide to actually achieving change at community grassroots level in a real way, using research for change, not just locking it up in journal articles and books and in the lecture theatre, um, and to having um, real dialogue between those of us who are outside and those who are inside the system. These were all really innovative and um, I've just seen it changing and developing over the years that Kia has been here. And I'm really grateful that um, Kia brought it, came to this country, this isolated outpost at the bottom of the Pacific um, and have shared their work and knowledge and experience and development with us. I was quite surprised actually to receive a uh, link from the university that wanted to hear um, what I had to say around the area of colonisation. But I think it was at a pivotal time not long after what we considered to be the 250 year colonisation and the replica endeavour arrival. So it was a follow on from that and um, coming here to discuss and talk about some of the issues that we faced at that time and the way in which Māori had interacted with the replica coming back to Aotearoa. So it was a really, was really a good experience to have met with you. I've met with the team. I found it was an awesome uh, programs that you had been running here and the, the ability to want to engage with our ethnic groups, our refugee groups, and where is the space for Māori in terms of what we can offer and what can be built in terms of our relationships. Those activists in residence conversations also become spaces for bringing in our community researchers, our community advisory group members in conversations and, and they become a dialogic spaces, if you will, for knowledge exchange. I think it's very important. I think it should be in every university because it allows that face-to-face -face contact with students that may, own, may not actually get that opportunity to learn from what's happening at the grassroots level with activists like ourselves and that misconception of what we actually represent and who we represent. And before then, before the program, the only way it's delivered is through media as to what that looks like. And that media is normally controlled what they see on TV is not necessarily what they get. And this experience allowed activism to come in, advocates to come in and actually share our experiences with other members of the university, students and community groups. You know, knowledge is generated in community. I think that is one of the uh, key lessons that we learn here um, at CARE. So the question for us is how do we intentionally build community, contribute to community and be in community for the work that we do? How do we recognize and acknowledge those um, that share their knowledge uh, to form our community? In terms of how we think of CARE, is in the idea of care as community and it's really important for us to uh, build that invitational spaces uh, with other um, academics as much as with activists and communities and we are so privileged well you know one of the things i really like is that it's a center that does things uh, that gets involved that's engaged and i think one of the things it does is to help to build strong and enduring collaborations and relationships with the key members of different communities. And I think that's really important for universities uh, to kind of build those relationships. And it's really important for the quality of the research that we do. Um, it addresses important community issues. It's a strong learning environment for all people involved, uh, the, uh, the researchers, the administrators, uh, the uh, community members, everybody learns uh, from the experience. And, and, and I like the fact that it supports the needs of different people who may feel disenfranchised, who may be marginalized, and helps them to improve their health outcomes. The principles of the co-papa of care around empowering communities to address their own 
problems and inequalities are so important um, in this day and age of kind of with, with the withdrawal of the, the welfare state, the underfunding of communities, um, and, and underfunding of, of welfare and care and health and these kind of things. So it's it's so important for communities to sort of be empowered to act for themselves to solve problems for themselves and and at the end of the day i mean what what else is communication research for if it's not about being about, about having a social impact and about like helping people and actually like addressing the really really bad problems of inequality caused by inequality in our modern society. The story of the center isn't just a series of projects that come one after another, and it's not just a series of concepts that come uh, one after another. Uh, a story that I often tell my students when trying to explain the culture-centered approach comes out of that experience of being with CARE while they were in Singapore, and that's that there was a, uh, a foreign domestic worker, uh, I believe she was Malaysian, working in Singapore, and had been involved in these conversations about how to create uh, the Respect Our Rights campaign that would, uh, that would inform employers of their obligations to foreign domestic workers. And creating that campaign is one thing, but that, uh, that particular domestic worker came up to uh, uh, Professor Dutta after the, the conversation where they were looking over the campaign materials and told a story to him about how her employer had seized her passport and was not allowing her to return to visit her family and that uh, she had accused her of stealing so that the police wouldn't help the foreign domestic worker. And to see how uh, uh, Professor Dutta and the other members of the care team stopped the research process and then engaged in a, how do we help this particular woman advocate for her needs? What are the resources that are available that CARE has connections to that we can uh, leverage? How can we talk to lawyers at the, the uh, legal clinic at the National University of Singapore? How can we use our connections with the police and our connections with the Ministry of Labor to, uh, or the Ministry of Manpower there to make sure that this woman, this particular woman, is able to recover her passport, is able to go back home? And to see that putting people first is an authentic thing that happens when the care center works with communities, rather than saying, how do we go to a community to get a publication? How do we go to a community to get a grant? It is an authentic experience of helping people when they express a need, when they express an interest, and leveraging our resources as members of the academic community, our resources as people who are more advantaged to serve those people. And I think, I think that kind of example is what shows how powerful care can be. I was beaten up every day. I had no off day. They made me work in home and office. I was deceived. Despite the Singapore law specifying very clearly the rights and terms of a foreign domestic worker employed in the country, there are many employers who are guilty of not respecting these agreements, often subjecting the foreign domestic worker to a violation of one or all of these terms of agreement in her contract. Based on Holmes' report in 2012, 96% of FVWs interviewed by Home had their documents confiscated, including copies of their contract. 78 of these 151 women were deceived about the content of the work contract. The contract protects the rights of both the worker and the employer, outlining specifically the FDW's right to food, shelter, days off, rest times, wages, place of residence, and conditions of work. Well, I know that there are, in addition to Mohan, um, a lot of great people that uh, got their start or got a great education uh, whether that was formal or informal, um, 
working in the care context. So my collaborator, Tarati Tayaroa, introduced me to the work of Professor Mohandatta. Together we studied one of Mohandas' texts titled Voices of Resistance. And one of the most compelling ideas to my mind was uh, this concept of communicative inequalities. I understood it as a concept that theorized inequalities in opportunities for voice, infrastructural and otherwise, uh, for voices to be heard. So the emphasis of the book I read as having this core idea of creating spaces for listening to voice and especially voices of resistance that aim to create openings for a politics of social change. So knowledge at the margins is embedded within struggles. You know, that is something we learn from communities at the margins that you cannot separate the process of knowledge generation from the struggles against the forms of marginalization. Tarati and I began to ask, uh, how can a hearing be made possible within the form of an exhibition? How might our practices create openings to listen to voices from the margins of the margins? Can curatorial practice be delinked from exhibition outcome and instead be motivated by ethics of listening, imagination, and relational commitments? In 2019, Tarati and I invited Professor Mohandatta to give a workshop on these topics at St. Paul Street Gallery's Curatorial Symposium. Afterwards, that same year, Tarati and I undertook an internship at CARE and trained in the CCA. I've had the good fortune since to work at CARE as a community researcher and a junior fellow. So a fundamental ethos of CARE is to place our bodies in the midst of struggle, in solidarity with struggle, because after all, if you're going to co-create voice infrastructures, uh, that calls for us as researchers, as community researchers, to be present in those struggles against uh, racism, against colonization, against um, capitalism, against um, Islamophobia, against casteism, depending upon the context, and actually then work to mobilize alongside communities in those struggles to transform structures. For me, as someone who's worked in the arts and culture, what care offers is a way to think through how to authentically connect um, the work that we might do in galleries and museums with a uh, aspiration for positive social change, for social justice and so on. And what I find the CCA to be really powerful in is um, guiding us and providing us pathways to make those connections as being centered on the voices of the margins of the margins. And this concept can sometimes feel uh, uh, difficult to theorize, but the methodology offers us in many ways how it is that we might attend to the processes of marginalization who are the peoples who are not being heard in mainstream narratives and if we think about galleries and museums in the contexts of what is considered and framed up as contemporary art. Um, so what I hope, I guess, for uh, the future in terms of my own involvement is to use, incorporate the culture-centered approach in the art and exhibition making work so as to authentically connect it with a social change politic. And then coming here to Aotearoa, you know, what I have found most beautiful is the solidarity of Maori uh, colleagues. We have a big involvement with our people, our iwi and our advisory group. Um, I don't know how we could have done it without care. Uh, it's care's um, not only interest, but it's their totoko, their manaakitanga, ki tātou uh, marae, ki, uh, ki amātou iwi, um, ngā hapuri hoki. And I think with care coming into the picture, it's made us realise they actually make us feel special and they make us feel like we've been listened to. You know, that kind of solidarity 
is just so tremendous and the uh, force of it um, anchored in um, aroha anchored in um, manakitanga anchored in mutual trust is so powerful in uh, sustaining the work that we do here at care I mean, our land occupation, our land is us and we are the land. We belong to the whenua and the same as the whenua is us. To have people come in um, like the Kawanatanga or the uh, Kaunieta or uh, Horizon, whoever, to come and take a piece of our land, that to us is like sacred, it's Tapu. And so in, in taking a piece of land and then giving it back means that that is a taonga. Our whenua is our taonga. And it's definitely not for sale and it should never have been used for the purpose of outside the iwi. All this land around here was Ngāti Kaufata's ancestral land and we lived on it and fed off it for two centuries. All our lands, they just come in like they've done many, many times before and just taken the land. The confiscation of our whenua has had a significant amount of long-standing grievances amongst our people. The process has been subject to criticisms from a number of different angles, from those who believe that the redress is insufficient to compensate for Māori losses, to those who see no value in revisiting the painful and continuous historical issues, today we stand and say, Kofata Tangata, what we say matters. I mean, we've been struggling for the last 180 years um, since the Treaty of Waitangi, and of course, uh, um, when you're told that there's a partnership in that treaty, we are still yet to see the full impact of that partnership. As we grapple with um, the colonizing forces of climate change, and climate change is inherently colonial because it is a product of the processes of large-scale colonialism and capitalism, and then the frontiers of capitalism, which is sort of neoliberal capitalism that has accelerated the process of climate change. So if you think about climate change as fundamentally colonial, then the question is how do we address climate justice and for the work of care uh, to address climate justice is to build infrastructures for the global south and the south in the north to participate in forms of knowledge generation and to work through these forms of knowledge generation to create solutions locally uh, to address um, uh, processes of um, erasure regionally and nationally and globally to challenge uh, the forces of colonialism and capitalism. We felt that we needed representation for our iwi, menga hapu, and when we had heard from the council that they weren't willing to accept our Māori ward, we had a meeting with all other iwi representative of 12 other marae in our area, um, after our who we decided that we were going to protest when our ward was rejected. So there was a couple of thousand of us and we were Ngahoe far. so even though we all whakapapa to Ngāti Kaufata, we had all our southern and northern uh, marae, and I have to acknowledge them, there was um, as far north as Parewahawaha, that's Bulls, Tukurangi, uh, um, Tehiri, Paupata Te, uh, Taumata, Aorangi, Kaufata, Tukurihi, Wehiwehi. So it, it's involved a lot of marae in our rohe, in our area. We push for the Māori ward and having somebody in there is better than not having anyone in there. And hopefully they can hear the voices of the people when we have now put somebody in there as uh, to uphold our mana award to having a voice here in, on the council and fielding um, and our connection to our marae uh, 
and now, and to her in the care group as well, um, involved in our projects and, and helping us total grow Manaki. It definitely has. I, I don't know how um, how we would have done it without the care group actually, and helping us moving forward and and also for the future generation. This isn't just for now. This is to help sustain our future generations as well. I mean, what what are they going to have when we're gone? You know, what, what do they fuck a papa back to? The confiscation of our land was the confiscation of our identity. The negative impact on our people has led to loss of tikanga, loss of language, poverty, homelessness, suicide, high crime rates, addiction, and so much more forced and beaten into a colonised way of living. This has affected generations before me and will be felt by generations after me. It was in the company of wonderful people uh, who I've already said are, were exceptionally bright uh, and capable, but they were also exceptionally nice to me. Uh, and I feel like some of those relationships, um, they were all important, but some of them will be lifelong uh, friendships. And it was, that's just extraordinary. Well, I think the Research Center reflects his values, uh, the values he has about um, equity in society, about fairness, about social justice. It uh, illustrates his sense of compassion, especially for those people who are uh, disenfranchised and marginalized in society. It also reflects his, uh, his strong desire to make a difference and to address important issues and to make the world a better place. I want to acknowledge that much of the foundation of my work, right, is very much rooted in, in CCA and the teachings of CCA. Um, and it, it continues to impact me uh, as an individual, as a scholar, as a teacher, right? I bring those into to my classroom, into my research. Um, and in a, especially for those of us who are, um, you know, uh, scholars of color, but also, you know, people who work uh, in spaces and critique um, oppressive power ar arrangements um, in our field um, and want to be grounded in social justice. And I think, you know, I just wanted to, to reiterate that even though um, he's located over there, his work continues to be impacted and felt, um, I think, across um, across all oceans. Uh, the community research is a part of team uh, care, the team. We're kind of all doing their own research around different things, but we all still came together to support and to talk with one another when it came to events or, um, I don't, you know, anything going on in those communities. So it just it did feel like a, a whānau, um working alongside the other community researchers as well. We call it whānau tanga here in our Māori um, language, but togetherness of feel good factor within um, youth have made us feel so good and so. Um, I guess, yeah, one. welcome. Yes, yeah, no, no, we've had a really, really, I've had a really, really good experience and everything with, with the care team. And so it was being able to see how, how that information that you read in a journal article or that you read in a textbook becomes live uh, when you go into the field, it becomes live when you engage with a member of an underserved community. How you see that it's not just a set, uh, the culture centered approach is not just a set of rhetorical devices. It's not just a set of standards that come out of theory, but by working with people in lived environments, being present in Singapore with care, let me see how you put those principles into action. I mean, the way that the, the, the care has been received, I mean, the, the impact that it's had just in like four, it's been here four years and two, two of those years have been during a pandemic, the way it's, and the kind of attendances that you've got for some other activist and residence sessions and 
and that kind of thing just sh shows yeah there was a real desire for something like this to happen and yeah it's, it's kind of yeah as you said, it's the right place at the right time i think it's one of the most in important things about care is that Professor Dada and others working with him are open to challenge, genuine challenges from other academics and from community activists and, and researchers that um, serious challenges that it's not uh, some kind of top-down hierarchical classic academic elitist space of which we have far too many in this country um, but that, that, that and in accepting that challenge of course that challenges people like me back and so it's you get that stimulation which true academics should actually you know relish and true activists should relish and that and that's one of the greatest things about care and from that dialogue and from that challenging of each other because he challenged <laughs> i'm challenged as well from that we both learn and of course that's what it's all about what i find the cca to be really powerful in is um guiding us and providing us pathways to make those connections as being centered on the voices of the margins of the margins. Who are the peoples who are not being heard in mainstream narratives? I would love to see more programs like this being fully resourced and put out into the communities and building those ethnic and Māori relationships to move forward and policy development to allow further doors to open and build for those groups that are actually struggling out in the communities. And Key gives us that opportunity to express how we feel and how we've been feeling in the last 180 years. It's given us the opportunity to create projects to better enhance the well-being and health of our people. So in the work of care going forward as a node for doing work on communication that foregrounds the voices of the Global South. The question is, how do we build these infrastructures for voice that um, will generate knowledge, that will participate in uh, struggles to secure a just uh, climate uh, future, and that will continue to offer leadership, if you will, uh, to conversations that connect communities, that connect activists, that connect um, academics in these processes of uh, social change.